Okay, I think we can um, resume. Uh, welcome back. Next uh, speaker is uh, Hannes Margraf from uh, from Berlin, who is already sharing his screen. So uh, please, uh, Hannes, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, thank you also to, to Jack for the invitation. Um, it's uh, been very interesting already. So I think this, I think this is a very nice format. Um, mixing these, um, uh, these kind of tutorial aspect with research talks. Um, so I've already learned a lot and I'm, I'm looking forward to the other talks as well. Um, and uh, you can see the title of my talk, it's Predicting Molecular Properties with Machine Learned Energy Functionals. And I think it has a, um, a slightly different um, tune than the, the previous talks. Um, I think uh, because I will focus less on the technicalities of the machine learning models and more on kind of the the physics and chemistry of what we want to predict and how we want to predict it. Um, now, uh, again, the, um, maybe building a bridge to the previous talks. So um, in terms of, of kind of this very nice overview that Jack gave, um, all of the things that I will be talking about will be regression models, okay? So essentially what, what I want to do and what I'm, uh, all of our work is about um, is, is predicting some molecular properties from coordinates in one, way or another, right? And this is a, a very well-established uh, field now. Um, uh, so basically the, the idea is that you can replace an expensive quantum chemical calculation by a machine learning model, but operationally everything looks the same. So you put in um, Cartesian coordinates in some ways, an XYZ file, and you get out the property you wanted. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll talk about how this works uh, in principle. Um, but this means that the, the way that our chemical data is represented is in terms of, of 3D geometries, right? This is a little bit different from what, um, what Jonathan was talking about, because in Jonathan's case, of course, the, the 3D coordinates are unknown and he has to deal with a, a little bit more um, abstract representation of the molecule, but we're assuming that we know the 3D coordinates. And in fact, we can even use our models to generate these 3D coordinates from simulations, right? So for example, if you have a regression model, and predicts energies and forces, you can use that model to optimize the geometry. Um, and, and this is what we frequently then uh, will be doing, but everything is centered around these 3D coordinates. Um, so this means that you need to, need to somehow find a machine readable representation of these coordinates. Um, and again, building a bridge to Jonathan's talk, he, he talked about these regimes of data. Um, we are mostly in the kind of small to medium data regime here. Uh, and all of the things that I'm, I'm talking about will be um, based on kernel models. So the, the other talks focus on neural networks, which are kind of the, the paradigmatic form of, of machine learning. Um, and, and ultimately the, the, the most powerful one. Um, kernel methods are, uh, I like them a lot because they are conceptually simpler, let's say, and also simpler to, to train because they simply use some metric of, of similarity between your data points. So in this case, between the, the coordinates and then build essentially a linear regression model using this, the similarity metric, right? So this makes things easier, but it doesn't really matter so much for my talk. So um, uh, I will be keeping the, the machine learning model quite abstract and in principle, you can replace the kernel models by neural networks. Um, it just depends a little bit on your perspective and your, and your personal choices. But the, the important part is that um, we don't want, so we, we, are, we want to build models that are data efficient, that don't require you know, millions of training data points. Um, and, and the kernel models are quite um, effective for this. So anyways, if you have such a, a kernel model or any machine learning model, you must somehow represent your, your, your geometries, your 3D coordinates. And there's a, a, a big zoo now of, of different methods that do this. So there's Jörg Bieler's symmetry functions, there's the Coulomb matrix, um, so MBTR, bag of bonds, and many other now newer um, uh, abbreviations that, that come up. Uh, some of these are actually not representation in themselves, but for whole machine learning models. So for example, graph neural networks that uh, Jonathan already mentioned kind of build their own um, representation um, uh, from, from data. Um, but the important thing that, that, that you have to understand uh, is that we take the 3D coordinates as inputs and then we 
transform them into some machine readable representations. And all of these things have in common that they are, um, or most of these and, and most of the ones that are, that are in common use um, are built around some concept of locality, just like Jonathan also mentioned. Um, so instead of having the, the complete geometry of a, of, a, of a molecule or a crystal um, uh, somehow uh, as input of the, of the uh, machine learning model, it's very beneficial to split this up into atomic contributions and then have these atomic contributions depend on kind of the immediate neighborhood of, um, of that atom. And this is advantageous simply because, first of all, it, it kind of introduces this, um, like the convolutional networks, it introduces a, a kind of um, length scale, so some prior information about, you know, what is important for the property of interest. So this makes things more efficient from that perspective. But secondly, it also means that the models are automatically size extensive. So you can train on small things and predict the large things, right? Because everything is just a sum of, of atomic contributions. And also everything is linear scaling in this way, right? But we will see that this also has some downsides um, uh, down the line, but, but it's, I would say the absolute industry standard now to use representations that are working with the neighborhood or the neighborhood densities is a common concept here. All right, um, and if you have now such a representations, uh, you, you can make things like this. So this is related to, uh, to the principal component analysis method that, um, that Jack also introduced. This is a so-called kernel principal component analysis. And basically it's a 2D map um, of uh, the QM9 database. So QM9, uh, will, I, I will mention this database again later. This is just a database of small organic molecules, very diverse, containing uh, different, different uh, light elements. Um, and in this kernel principle component an analysis now, your representation is used in such a way that um, points that are close to each other on this map are chemically similar in some way. Um, and now if we color this map according to a electronic property like the atomization energy, um, you will find that this tends to vary kind of smoothly across the space. And this is really the whole idea behind these, these kernel methods and machine learning in general. Um, that, that you can use a, a structural input uh, information. You can have some information about the electronic property, right? So for example, you could do a, a, a DFT or, or a couple of cluster calculation for each of these highlighted points here. And then you should be able to interpolate the property across chemical space to unknown structures, simply because you assume that the property will, will be somehow um, similar if the structure is similar itself. And then how similar and how the similarity is measured, that's kind of where all the magic happens and, and uh, that's what the machine learning model really does. But qualitatively, it's all about the, this idea of, of similarity of structures. And then in a very cartoonish way, your regression model then, then looks like this. So you take your 3D coordinates, you build a representation, you know, this typically is uh, as a vector or more precisely, it would be one vector for each atom in your system. Um, and then this representation gets fed into the um, machine learning model and makes a prediction, right? So I illustrated this here with this little price tag. So you, you basically label your, your molecule. And um, the, the way that the machine learning black box here knows how to do this prediction is that it's been trained on other labeled molecules. So in other words, you have some upfront investment here that you have to make um, in terms of quantum chemical calculations. Um, but once this upfront investment is made and the training is done, your prediction here will be very cheap. And this is the way, you know, also, I think Jamison mentioned this, that, that you typically uh, make some, some gains because then, um, you know, you have a big database, but maybe you only need to train on five or 10 or 20% of the database. And that's really, I think, economically, the way you should think about these models. Of course, the prediction is always cheap because these things are made to be cheap in prediction, but, but you have to take into account the, the training cost of it. And um, very briefly, just because this is kind of out of scope of, of, of this talk, um, but, but I want to mention this because this is really the, let's say the, the standard methodology here. Um, so we've been using this kind of stuff for different things, for, for crystal structure prediction. We've been using it uh, to predict electronic properties of organic semiconductors. And we've also been studying um, chemical reaction networks with this, with this type of methodology. And, and it really, so I think the, 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 the motivation for using machine learning methods, in my view, it's really a practical one, right? So the point of all this is that with these machine learning models, we can do things that we couldn't do with 
brute force electronic structure calculations. And whenever I have a project where I can do it with brute force electronic structure calculations, I still prefer to do this, right? So the machine learning is not a, it's kind of a means to an end. Okay, but having said all this, um, we have to acknowledge, and I think especially in this kind of uh, pedagogical uh, setting of this, of this discussion meeting, um, we have to acknowledge that there are also problems with all this. And the problems are basically, so the, let's say the problems that I run into in, in my day-to-day um, -day work um, are related to these three things. So one is the, this aspect of data efficiency. So once you've chosen your machine learning model and your representation and all this, um, the only way that you can really improve your prediction accuracy is by adding more data to the model, right? This is ultimately, you know, there's no free lunch. Um, you, can, you can do the, have kind of the optimal method uh, for, a, for a given task, um, but you will not achieve unlimited prediction accuracy with this way. The only way to improve the accuracy of a machine learning model um, is to increase the training set and, and ultimately. Um, but this means that, that it might just be not worth building the model in the first place, right? If I need 100,000 DFT calculations to get the accuracy I desire, um, for many projects, this is, this is much more than I would need to, to just do the, the project itself. So some projects are not worth doing with machine learning simply because the methods are not data efficient enough. The other aspect is this, um, this point of transferability. Again, uh, Jonathan mentioned this with the distribution shift for the perovskites. Um, what happens if you're outside the scope of your training set or your, your training set is very much focused on one type of structure and you make predictions on a different kind of structure? Um, for kernel methods, especially, this is, this is clearly a problem because you're using similarity to make your prediction. And if, if what you're predicting on is not similar to your training set, there's very little the, the, uh, the method can do. Um, now, the way to solve this is to add more training data, but of course that then leads to a less data efficient method. So, so these two things are kind of linked and, and um, uh, yeah, they, they, they kind of go together and you can't really get rid of them. Um, and the third thing is, is related to this locality. So what if my, my target property, for example, an energy uh, in, a, in a polar molecule or something uh, has a very significant contribution from long range, for example, electrostatic interactions or dispersion, which can also be quite long range. Um, the, my, my local representation by definition will miss these contributions. Um, so, so I need to worry about this aspect as well. And, and so the, the rest of my talk now will be focused on um, kind of strategies to deal with these problems. Um, and very generally speaking, the, the way that, that we address these problems is by introducing more physics into these models. So we, we take an ML model as the black box that it is, uh, and we try to kind of surround it by a, a, a more transparent interpretable box of, of physical insight. Um, and, and this will then hopefully make the thing more data efficient because we are already putting some uh, physical information in. Um, it will make it more transferable because kind of maybe uh, boundary conditions or, or certain limits are fulfilled by the physical, um, uh, by the physics I built into the model. Um, and also if, if my, my ML model is local, I can use a non-local, so a, a, a long range physical model as well. By the way, just because uh, to, to, uh, to avoid any misunderstanding here, locality here is not meant in the sense of uh, the local density approximation that you're really local in three-dimensional space. I'm really referring to this, this issue of um, your descriptor being or your representation being um, short range. So that would actually be a better word for it, maybe. Um, so it's all about the you know, immediate chemical environment, nearest neighbors, next nearest neighbor, this kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and not about very long range things. Okay, so this, this general idea of introducing more physics into the models is uh, of course not, not, not our idea. It's the, uh, I think a very common approach because simply because it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and especially of course, physicists <laughs> love to do this. Um, so for example, you know, the, the classic thing that you do when you build these representations uh, is that you build invariances into, into the representation. For example, the energy is invariant to rotations and to translations. This means that you shouldn't use Cartesian coordinates as your representation because Cartesian coordinates are not invariant to rotations and translations. Um, so instead you use representations that, that fulfill these invariances and now you no longer need to learn this from data, right? In principle, you could. You could use a very stupid representation 
and then feed your model with all kinds of rotated um, uh, training molecules, for example, um, and then we'll learn that the energy is an invariant property, at least approximately, but this means you need a lot more training data and it will only learn this invariance approximately. So this, this uh, idea of kind of adding rotated examples, for example, this would be a, an example of data augmentation. And it's also a valid strategy, um, but we try to avoid it. And, and it's, um, in my view, much better to build in as much of these things exactly as you can. So the same goes for symmetries. Um, and what I will talk about for the rest of this talk now is um, about electronic structure information in some way. Again, this is this is not a new idea. Um, so, for example, uh, there's this uh, um, now widespread delta learning approach that we also use in, in some cases, which means that you use a very cheap electronic structure method as a baseline, so some tight binding model, for example, uh, and then you only learn a correction on top of that tight binding model. Right? This makes a lot of sense, and in, in many cases, um, it, it's, it's the best strategy because the tight binding model already does a lot of things qualitatively correctly, and maybe it has some some reasonable um, limits. Um, so it's a lot easier and a lot safer and more transferable if you just learn a correction on top of it. There's also um, work, and, and I think this is more in the vein of what we are doing, um, that really directly builds the machine learning model inside of a um, electronic structure calculation. Um, I think uh, Christoph Schutt uh, will, will give a talk about this tomorrow, so I don't need to introduce it too much. But anyways. Um, <clears throat> All right, so what kind of electronic structure information am I talking about? Um, I am going to focus on the electron density, which as you know, is a very fundamental and important electronic property. So the electron density is, is interesting and, and important because it's interesting in its own right. So you can get electrostatic potentials and, and dipole and higher moments from it, which are really important for, for example, um, predicting IR spectra or predicting interactions of, of molecules in, uh, in the long range. Um, you can derive some properties from the electron density, uh, you know, um, uh, and then also through density functional theory, of course, you can also get energies and forces from the density in some way. And the good thing about going, I mean, this is a little bit of a detour, right? I already said that you can directly predict energies and forces from the structure. <clears throat> but of course, then you have this locality aspect. Um, the advantage of going through DFT to, to predict energies and forces is that you have, you know, correct long range electrostatics built in, for example, if you just evaluate them exactly from the, from the electron density. Okay, so um, some, some re very relevant work that I, that I have to mention in this context is the work of, of Michele Ciaviotti and, and uh, co-workers on predicting the electron density. So one thing that you can do is you can use the, the machinery of uh, chemical machine learning that I just um, outlined um, uh, in this case, this is a symmetry adapted um, Gaussian process regression version. So this is also kernel regression, basically. <coughs> and then you can predict the electron density in a localized basis using the same type of local approach. So the idea is you decompose the density into, into atomic contributions, and then you build a regression model that predicts each um, local contribution to the density um, from the local environment. Right? So you're still local in your prediction, but what you get out is the density. And then in principle, you can use the density, for example, to calculate the heart rate energy. So to calculate the long range electrostatics of your system. Um, now, this is nice and it works, but uh, in terms of like predicting energetics, it's not really satisfactory. And the reason for this is that, of course, the density itself um, in a, in a Quanchan calculation, it, uh, it it, it, it depends on itself, right? It has a long range dependence on itself um, because electrons interact with each other in a, in, a, in a kind of long range way. So even though you can get reasonably accurate predictions of electron densities or quite, um, uh, um, quite accurate predictions of, of electron densities in terms of like metrics that, that are related to really the, the three dimensional charge distribution, um, it turns out that calculating the heart rate energy of this predicted density um, is very inaccurate in the end. It's not, not really um, useful for that uh, purpose. Also, some, some problems that arise from this, this locality is, of course, that you, you don't automatically conserve charge. Very often, this works approximately, or you can also correct for it post hoc, um, but it's a problem. And especially if you have some long range charge transfer, you have a system that is inhomogeneous, that has uh, portions of, of wildly different uh, electronegativities. Um, this is something that, that uh, such a model will not be able to capture. 
So an alternative approach is to use an energy functional and, you know, at, at the end of the day, so this will be the end of, of this talk also, um, uh, what this means, of course, is to do density functional theory. But um, for the first step, we can keep it a little bit more, more, more simple and, and talk about an, a more approximate um, uh, density representation. Um, but anyways, the, the point is, if you have an energy functional, you know, E of, of rho or of, you know, partial charges Q, um, and I, I, I minimize that energy functional according to the density, then this gives me a, a prediction of the density that has the correct long range behavior built in, and that also has charge conservation built in, or at least I can build it in through Lagrange multipliers. Okay, there are uh, two very relevant um, uh, papers in, in this uh, respect. So there's work of, of Stefan Gudecke going back uh, a few years. Um, and very recently, this paper by Schiphas and Smalls that used this, this basic idea. So you, you don't predict the full density, but you predict bar partial charges, essentially. Um, and then you, you build a, a energy model that predicts, uh, that depends on those partial charges and you self-consistently optimize the partial charges. So this is really cool. Um, but it's of course more complicated than the previous example. Um, and also has some, some other downsides. Of course, we are talking about a simplified representation. This is not necessarily a downside because of course it also means that the whole thing is um, uh, computationally very cheap. Um, but also the, you're kind of learning the density very indirectly in this case, because the only thing you're training on in the, at the end of the day are energies. Um, and, and in this sense, the, the density or your partial charges are more like an auxiliary quantity that you use to um, to predict the, 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 the energy, but um, you, you don't have kind of a quality measure on those, uh, on those charges themselves. So we've been recently um, uh, working on this very topic as, as well. And the, the approach we, we came up with for this um, is called kernel charge recuperation. Um, so before, before I get into this, let me briefly explain what I mean by an approximate representation of the electron density. Um, so you see here this cartoon of, of an acetylene molecule that has these four nuclei, and this is kind of what the electron density of, of acetylene, you know, in this toy uh, depiction looks like. And what we're going to do is instead of predicting the, the whole electron density or using the whole electron density as a variable, we split it into some reference density and a, a fluctuation term, just like you do, for example, in, in density functional type binding and any other um, approaches. Um, and so this, this, this row zero here would be kind of isolated spherical uh, electron densities for all the atoms. And you can see that if you place each of um, you know, these spherical densities on top of the atoms, you already get a kind of reasonable description of the density. This is the case in this um, cartoon. It's also the case in reality, uh, actually. Um, and, uh, but, but of course, some things are missing. So first of all, the individual atoms are not polarized in any way but also kind of this, the polarization of the whole molecule or the charge transfer within the molecule is not described. So, you know, here you have a little bit too much electron density on the hydrogen and too little on the carbons if you do this. Um, so this is what this fluctuation term is all for, right? So this is another set of um, uh, spherically symmetric, um, you know, one as Gaussian functions essentially that we put on top of these molecules to correct for deviations of the isolated, you know, superposition of atomic densities. Um, uh, and the real electron density. Um, and because we are using here these, these spherically symmetric um, Gaussians as basis functions, this is not perfect, right? We will still be missing some polarization. For example, in acetylene, you have higher electron density between the carbon atoms because there's this, this triple bond here. So this will, will, will not be described correctly, um, but, but the, this, this uh, you know, rho naught plus delta rho approximation is much closer to the real density than, um, the, uh, the, the pure superposition of atomic densities. And importantly, um, these details that we are missing are less important in the long range limit, right? And since I'm always thinking about this in terms of combining uh, uh, these models with a, a long range, uh, with a short range ML model anyways, I'm not so concerned about, you know, details that I'm missing that are mainly important for, for in, in the short range, as long as I get the, the, the long range picture correctly. Um, anyways, this has the advantage that my, my expansion coefficients here of this delta rho are essentially just partial charges. So this reduces the whole problem of, of you know, finding the electron density to finding partial charges. And then I can, I can just look into the literature how, you know, what are physical models, you know, energy functions that, that, that 
upon minimization, give me partial charges. And uh, I think the most uh, well-known approach of these is the, the QEQ, so the charge equilibration uh, method of Lapie and Goddard, um, and it's you know, many uh, related methods. Um, and and what, what this does is essentially it uses a, a energy expression um, that depends on the charges in this um, second order Taylor expansion, where you have one parameter here for each element that is an ele electronegativity, and a second one that is an um, uh, atomic hardness. And then you basically here have the, the interaction of these partial charges as kind of a um, Hartree energy of the fluctuation potential. So we can call this the side energy, and this is kind of the, the charge interaction term. And this is, of course, what builds in this, this long range dependence of the, um, of the density. Um, now, this is nice, um, but of course, it's a kind of crude method, and it's not, not quantitatively accurate for, for all kinds of things. Um, so what we can do is we can um, modify these electronegativities to be um, environment dependent. And the way we do this is using these short range representations and kernels that I already talked about, right? So, so this is a typical kernel rich regression or kernel reg regression expression that you get in, in, in these methods. So you have some uh, uh, weights here, some regression weights, that's what your training will get you. And then you have a function K here that measures the similarity between the environment of key A, uh, of atom A, right? And the environment of some training molecule. Okay, so how do we train these things? Uh, now we can take advantage of another thing that, that uh, thankfully uh, Jack already mentioned in, in, in his uh, introductory talk. Um, so it turns out if you have a bunch of linearly dependent things and you plug them into each other, everything is still linear. And uh, Jack mentioned this in the context of neural networks as kind of a disadvantage and that's why you need um, the nonlinearity. But in kernel regression actually we want to keep everything linear, because this way we can we can um, uh, solve for the um, regression coefficients in a in a closed form manner. Um, so it turns out the dipole moment of a molecule uh, is the linearly dependent on the charges, right? And this this matrix R here basically um, are uh, the center of mass shift to coordinates of the atoms, um, and the charges are linearly dependent on the electronegativities. So this is just a property of um, uh, QEQ, right? So we have a vector here that contains all of the electronegativities of the atoms. And we have a matrix here that basically wraps in all of the charge-charge uh, interaction contributions. Um, and then if I, if I multiply this matrix by this vector, I get a new vector that are the, the charges on the atoms. And the third linear dependence we have is that the electronegativities, and this is what, what we introduced, are linearly dependent on um, these regression coefficients, right? So this means I can, I can build a loss function uh, that is just a least squares kind of thing. And this expression here, RAKW now combines all of these um, uh, above linear dependencies. And this is the predicted dipole moment. And I just want to minimize the error of the predicted dipole moment with respect to the reference dipole moment. And then I have a second term here, which is a regularization. We haven't talked about regularization yet today, at least not explicitly, but regularization is basically a way of um, avoiding overfitting in these very flexible machine learning models. It's, it's not so important, but it gets you an additional hyperparameter that, that controls overfitting. And then we take the derivative of this um, loss function, we set it to zero and we solve for the weights. And this is what you get at the end. It looks a little bit complicated, it looks maybe like, like a Klingon wrote this, but um, essentially it's just the linear algebra expression that you solve and that gets you the reg regression weights. And this is what training is in, in uh, kernel charge equilibration models. And um, we can do this, um, we can use this very easily um, to predict uh, dipole moments. So this is again the QM9 database. Um, we calculated the, the dipole moments at the TPP0 level here, so hybrid TFT level. Um, and the first thing that you can see, so this is a, a learning curve. This is the mean absolute error in the dipole moment uh, with respect to the number of training points. Uh, you can see that introducing this flexibility here of, of making the uh, Electronegativity environment dependent is a big bonus. So th this is a normal QEQ model, also trained on the same data, but without this environment dependence. Um, and then by introducing the environment dependence, the error markedly goes down. The other thing that is interesting, so here you see different curves for KQEQ that all have a, a different cutoff value for the local representation. So the representation we're using, if you're curious, is called SOAP. And it's not so important though. Um, you could use any of these local representations here. 
Um, but the point is it defines a cutoff. And if we use a very short cutoff, like 1.7 angstrom, so this is really a pure nearest neighbor thing, um, it, it already works quite well, although you see that there's kind of a saturation in, in this learning curve. Um, and then we can use different other models. We can, for example, use larger cutoffs, or we can kind of use combined representations that have a short and long range aspect to them, uh, which is what works best for us. Um, and you can see that, first of all, it's always an improvement on QQ, but also that it that really systematically improves if we add more, more data points. Um, very briefly, we can also compare this to other models. So, so these are um, two other um, uh, uh, machine learning models for dipole moments from the literature. Uh, so FCHL here, this is kind of a straw man, let's say, because this is a, a very naive model that simply predicts the dipole moment as a scalar. This doesn't work very well, actually, even if you train it on a fairly large amount of data. Um, and it turns out that kind of our simple QEQ model is actually as good as this machine learning model. Um, but then here, this is a more sophisticated approach by, by, by Lilienfeld and co-workers um, that, that predicts the dipole moment as, a, as an energy derivative. So if you take the uh, derivative of the energy with re respect to an applied field, you get the dipole moment, and this is what is predicted here. Um, this is a, a, a significant improvement on, on pure QEQ, um, but you can see that the kernel QEQ is a, a lot better than this. Um, and then here, this mu ML is a, is a model by, by uh, the Chelyotti group again, they, which kind of uses the same idea they have for, for predicting full electro densities, so it decomposes the dipole moment into local atomic and dipole contributions. Um, and we're kind of on par with that, although we use a, a simpler density uh, representation using only partial charges. All right, okay. So this was kind of the, the first big uh, project I wanted to talk about. So you can see that um, by defining this energy functional that depends on the partial charges and minimizing it, we can get a, a, um, a prediction of dipole moments or of charge distributions uh, that, that has some nice properties. So it conserves the charge exactly. It properly treats long range uh, Coulomb interactions between the charges. Uh, and a, a bonus on top of, of the things that, that we saw before of, of, of Goetheca and of uh, Xipas and Smalls uh, is that it, it has the simple closed form linear, linear algebra expression for training. Uh, also, we are directly training on the density through the dipole moment in, in the sense. So it's not just an energy model that happens to produce a density as, a, as an intermediate step, but we are really predicting um, you know, properties of the density directly. Okay, but of course we are still doing this in, in this kind of simplified partial charge picture. So what if I want the full thing? What if I want the real electron density you know, uh, in, in all its um, glory and complexity as it is um, shown here by this, by this uh, ISO surface? Um, <clears throat> well, then you have to do DFT. That, that's that's kind of obvious. That that's exactly what DFT is. DFT is a energy dependent or a, a den electron density dependent energy functional that, when you minimize it, gets you the the, the electron density out. Right. This is what a self consistent DFT calculation does. And of course, this 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 energy functional it consists of of uh, some well known contributions. So you have the kinetic energy contribution. You have an external potential uh, contribution, so basically charge um, nucleus interactions and, and other things. Uh, you have the Hartree energy, which is the electron electron interaction. And then you have the, the famous exchange correlation functional, which treats kind of these non classical um, effects. All right. So if we, are want, if we want to build DFT functions from ML, we could, of course, go directly here to the, to the full uh, density functional. But since we want to keep as much physics into the model as possible, I think it's a very reasonable to, to look at um, kind of which of these contributions we want to approximate with an ML model and which of them we want to treat differently. And I think the, the, the kind of obvious candidates for, for ML modification are the kinetic energy functional and the exchange correlation functional. Because the external potential and Hartree energy, first of all, they are not so expensive to evaluate. And second of all, they get all of this you know, correct long range behavior into, into the model. So um, these are the things that I definitely want to treat physically correctly. Um, and then there, there have been many, many um, papers very recently on, 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 on the other two functionals, right? So there's work on, on the kinetic energy functional by uh, especially Kieran Burke, but also um, uh, Isaac Tamblin here. Um, 
And there's a lot of work on, on the exchange correlation functionals. So either you know, separately looking at exchange or correlation or both together. Um, uh, so I just uh, show here some references. This is a very active field, so I'm sure I'm, I'm missing some, but um, uh, there's a lot, lot of interesting stuff to read. Okay, and of course then for the exchange correlation functionals, they are quite good approximations already. So what we want with ML is to get really improved non-local functionals that go kind of beyond what, um, uh, uh, you know, PBE and co are, are able to do. Um, but of course, this means um, uh, that, that we are kind of striving for wave function accuracy, let's say. Um, in the, on the kinetic energy side, it's of course also a very interesting field because there's really no um, kinetic energy functions that are really satisfactory and widely applicable um, uh, at the moment. So this is why mostly then uh, Kohn-Sham DFT is used, which uh, kind of circumvents this. Um, and in fact, in, in all of the following work, we will also use a Kohn-Sham framework. So we are only focusing on exchange and correlation and we get the uh, kinetic energy from, from the orbitals and the external potential and Hartree energy we get exactly. All right. So when we got into this field, um, our first approach was to look at how the DFT correlation energy is computed. Um, and as you know, in, 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 in most DFT codes, uh, this is done by, by numerical quadrature. So essentially you have your functional define a energy density. So this is a function in real space that depends on the electron density. And if you integrate this function, so for example, if you do it numerically, um, you will be integrating over, kind of looping over a, a grid of points with some weights and evaluating that, that function on each of these points um, and then summing them all up. And that gets you then the correlation energy. I'm gonna focus on the correlation energy here because this is kind of the, the, the first thing we did. Um, and it has some, some, some quirks as you will see. Okay, so the good thing about this approach is that it's naturally size extensive because it has this, this kind of grid nature built into it, right? So if you double your system size, you just get twice as many grid points and the energy is twice as high and everything is, is, is as it should be. <laughs> now, the problem of course is that usually the, the dependence of the energy density on the electron density is very simple. It depends locally on the value of the, of the electron density and it maybe depends on the gradient or uh, some, some other um, uh, derivatives of the density. And this leads to all of the problems that, that um, GGA functions basically have you know, with respect to self-interaction and, uh, and other pathologies. So ML, what, what ML can do here is in principle, it can allow a more flexible non-local relationship between epsilon and rho. But the problem you have is that if you are only have information about the total correlation energy and you're trying to infer this energy density, this is a very imbalanced and ill-posed problem, right? So for even for such a simple molecule, I have you know, tens, of, tens of thousands of, of, of grid points on which I need to define the energy density, but I only have one reference the, um, density to fit to, uh, or one reference correlation energy to fit to. So this is less of a problem in, in exchange where I can uniquely define a um, uh, energy density on a grid, but for correlation, it's a big problem. Now, um, of course, what you can do is you can, there's different ways of doing this and, and we devised one way to, to project the couple cluster energy onto a grid and then also have a couple cluster energy density. And this, this, this is kind of nice. Um, so, so if you do this for H2 and equilibrium, it looks all quite reasonable. So this is the electron density, here's the correlation energy density you get. This is a function that is um, again, defined in, in real space and it's uh, negative throughout. And if you integrate over it, you get the correlation energy out. Um, but it turns out that this is a, a kind of messy thing. And in fact, if you, if you look at, at kind of um, multi-center systems, especially at stretch bonds, you can get very non-local and weird features in this correlation energy density. So for example, if I stretch H2, I'm now out here at uh, two angstrom, um, you will get a, a big positive peak in the correlation energy density between your, your centers. Um, and, and this is problematic. First of all, it's a little bit unphysical to have a positive correlation energy. Um, and secondly, um, the electron density here, here is very low, but that's a very important feature that I need to add into this, um, uh, into the functional. So this means that my, my, my DFT functional that is trying to reproduce this correlation energy density has to be extremely non-local. And this leads to all kinds of problems. So this was kind of a dead end, to be honest. And, and what we ended up doing uh, was, was actually focused on uh, mononuclear systems that are much more well-behaved. Um, 
but but these are actually too simple then to use with machine learning and we ended up just getting a way of, of fitting GGA functions, let's say. All right, so uh, how much time do I have left? I guess 10 minutes or? Yeah, 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 yeah. Enough, 10 minutes. Okay, okay, so I have to raise a little bit. Um, all right, so, so the, the approach we now chose to, uh, to avoid this issue is that um, instead of defining this energy density on a grid, we choose a different representation of the density that doesn't live on a grid. So because the, the grid is what's causing us these problems because it has so many points and we only have one reference energy to fit to. So if you look at uh, different ways of representing the density, um, one very convenient way of doing it is using density fitting. So in, in density fitting, you, you represent the, the electron density as a linear combination of atom-centered um, uh, basis functions. And this means that you can now decompose the, the density into atomic contributions. This is in fact what, what the Chariotti group used for predicting the, the, the density. Um, so in other words, these coefficients here of the density fitting expansion, they are highly compressed and transferable representation of the electron density. Um, so you have much fewer coefficients, you know, maybe uh, tens or hundreds per per um, uh, per atom, rather than you know tens of thousands. So this is good. Uh, then you can use some additional tricks. You can build in rotation invariance into this um, density rep representation, um, and this way you can build a, a, a kernel function that measures the similarity of these atomic density contributions that you uh, that you see illustrated here. And then this means that um, these, these atomic kernels, once you've defined them, you can sum them up to make a, a kernel for the whole system and compare entire systems. And then you can easily build a, a um, kernel regress regression model um, that only uses the electron density as input, right? Okay, so this is a, a pure non-local density function that you get. And yeah, as I said, I have to raise a little bit for time reasons, but basically this works. You're learning curves for different systems. Um, uh, you are already using um, of course, the, the Hartree-Fock energy and, and density as a baseline here. Um, so it's very easy with just maybe 100 training points to get highly accurate predictions on, on these different kinds of systems. And importantly, it's also transferable because we use this atomic um, uh, kernel uh, approach. So this means that I can train on one to four water molecules, for example, and predict on eight water molecules, or I can predict on, on you know, small alkanes and, and predict on, on octane here. Um, quite accurately. We've also used this then to use, um, uh, to, to predict kind of uh, high quality couple cluster free energy surfaces by reweighting uh, empirical ones. Um, for time reasons, I have to skip this. Um, but anyway, so this is, this is nice and it works quite well. Um, but of course the caveat is that this is a post SCF procedure. So we are doing a hard fuck calculation. We get the density from there and we predict the correlation. Can we also do this self-consistently to predict the, the density itself? Well, we can. Um, and technically, it's, it's not a problem at all. So as you know, what, what we need um, to get a, a, um, a self-consistent calculation is basically the, um, the exchange correlation um, potential, which is just a derivative of, of the um, exchange correlation energy that can get analytically. Um, but the, uh, a problem that was already noted by Miller and Berg um, and, and Matthias Rupp also actually was, was also talking tomorrow um, is that the self-consistent optimization then leads to very unphysical densities because the, the functional doesn't know that these unphysical densities are unphysical, right? You've only trained it on kind of here, uh, this illustrated by these black points, you've only trained it on a, on a manifold of physical densities um, and, and there's nothing that stops the functional from running away into the completely unphysical regions. Um, so in, in this paper, Müller, Berg, Rupp, and Snyder um, uh, presented a, a solution to this by kind of projecting out the unphysical parts of the gradient here. And um, we are using a different approach. We use iterative training. Um, so this means that um, here's a very simple example for CO. Um, so here uh, you see, a, uh, again, a PCA projection of, of the training and test densities for CO at different bond lengths. Um, and then we run SCF with a model that is trained on these, these training data, and it leads to completely bogus densities. Um, so this is illustrated here and on this density difference plot compared to MP2. Uh, I should mention that now we are actually predicting uh, exact exchange in MP2 correlation. Uh, um, 
And yeah, so this is problematic and this is exactly what, what I just uh, was talking about. But of course, this means that now we have some unphysical densities to train to. So really all we have to do is we have to teach the machine learning model that this is unphysical, it's high in energy. And if we do this by adding these unphysical densities to the training set, we can iteratively improve the densities, right? And you can see that now after some iterations, the, the um, SCF densities really approach the manifold of physical densities and also this uh, density error here disappears. And in fact, we for kind of more complex systems than CO, we don't need as many iterations because there's also a lot of information in different configurations. So this is an example for water diamonds. Um, we only use two refinement steps here. If we train on 10 configurations, it's kind of crappy. Um, uh, so you see here, we have a big uh, energy error and also we have a big um, density error, but of course, 10 configurations is very little. And then if we, if we increase the training set, we really get a good correlation for the predicted energies, but also for the predicted densities. Um, so this is very nice. Energies and densities improve with more training um, in a very consistent and, and physically sound way. All right, okay. So this is all I wanted to talk about. So I, I hope I've shown you something about um, increasing data efficiency and, and kind of overcoming these locality constraints by using these uh, integrated ML electronic structure methods. Um, the one version is this kernel charger calibration, which gets a cheap physically motivated partial charge model essentially. Um, the other are these uh, kernel DFT methods that are really you know, full blown DFT functionals um, that can get wave function accuracy for energies and densities through self-consistency. All right, so that's all. I'd like to thank uh, Carsten, Simon, Martin, Christian, who are all working on these projects, uh, as well as Gabo and, and uh, Carsten, who are uh, yeah, also involved in these projects as, as supervisors and uh, uh, mentors, let's say. OK, so thank you very much. Thank you, Hannes. Thank you. Um, OK, so we are ready for, uh, for a discussion. There was already. Um, uh, a question on the chat, if you can reach it from Lorenzo, mm -hmm. uh, very much related to this density in which I would also like to pitch in, but after you, you, you answer that, so. Yes, okay, yeah, um, so I don't want to represent, uh, misrepresent Michele's work here. Um, uh, so, so the question is, how, how is it possible that the density is accurate, but the, the heart rate energy is not? Um, and, and this is, um, I, sh I should be more precise here. So the, 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 the thing is that you can, of course, also predict the heart rate energy in a structure-based machine learning model, right? So if you want to do machine learning to get the heart rate energy, one way is to do the, the, the classical thing of just using a structural representation and using this to predict the heart rate energy. And it turns out that this is actually more accurate than using the machine learning to predict the density and then computing the heart rate energy directly. Okay, so it's not that it's completely wrong, but it's there's no benefit in going through the density in this case. So th this is what I should say. And the other thing that um, I think, I guess that, that this is related to is uh, the metric you use to define a good density. And, and this is well known in, in kind of the DFT um, world and, and these density fitting approximations. So, so uh, as you know, the, the, the most common way of doing density fitting or our resolution of the identity for, for DFT codes is to use the Coulomb metric. And this is exactly for this reason, because it turns out that it's much more accurate to fit the Coulomb metric, which is fitting the heart rate energy in some way, uh, than to fit the density, right? If you fit to the density itself in, a, in the sense of like, you know, <clears throat> it's spatial distribution, um, this leads to slightly different density fits than fitting to the to the heart rate energy. And what what is now commonplace in most codes is to use the uh, yeah the RIJ method, which which fits to the Coulomb metric. Um, I would like to pitch in before giving the discussion to to other participants. Um, this point about the density is very uh, is very important. So I would like to take it in the other in the, the reverse order because the density is something that if you have to use it to, to describe other observable, like the total energies or the forces, like you mentioned. So it is the other way around in the sense that you need a very good density, right? Because uh, indeed, uh, 
not only the heart tree and the heart tree energy or potential but <clears throat> in general um, the dependence of observables with with the density is very subtle no it's very complicated so you can imagine very different system which has a very very similar profile in the density this is what we teach to our dft courses right mm -hmm. so then that means that the unobservable must depend on the density in a very very subtle way so the the fact to have a very precise density um, is indeed a crucial issue and um, and this uh, it's um it's related to what we're gonna do also this afternoon you know it's um, having uh, let's say observable coming out from the density it means uh, having uh, a dependence on the very very small feature of the density because uh, overall two very similar density can lead to completely different system to completely different observables do you agree yes i i agree i agree i think Basically, um, self consistently, uh, self consistency is very helpful here, because um, so something that we have observed here, if you, if you look at the, at the DFT functional, right, and it has the, for example, you, you fit an exchange energy functional, right, um, the 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 errors we see on on our fitting property, which is the ex exchange energy, tends to be larger than the error we get for the total energy, because there are some trade offs here, of course. For example. Um, there's kind of, an, if, if I make a, a, a density more compressed, the exchange energy will be more negative, but the heart rate energy will be more positive. Um, and so, so this is something that helps you a little bit. So, so it's, it's, it's a, I think it's a very subtle issue, but so on, on one hand, you're right that there are very subtle um, dependencies of, of, or it can be very, very strong dependencies of properties on the densities. At the same time, if you look at, you know, LDA, which is a, horrible approximation in, in some sense, right? It's, it's a very simple approximation, let's say. It's actually a beautiful model, but it's a, it's a very simple approximation. Um, uh, it, 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 it does amazingly well at predicting many properties, right? Yeah. So. Okay. Um, there was a question from Andreas, please. Thank you. It's, in fact, it is um, kind of a, a continu uh, continuation of what you said. And I think um, that's why we miss now this uh, real conferences where we could discuss all this issue over lunch <laughs> or longer. <laughs> um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe, I, maybe you can put the expression which you thought for this Goddard trap uh, types of... Uh, uh, once, just a side remark, don't you have a first order turn in the heart rate energy, rho times delta rho? Yes, that, that's true. We neglected. Oh. But there's a first order. Okay. But I think that's something related to the first turn. Um, um, this is, um, I remember there was a talk by uh, Gatti. Uh, he was working with this um, Bader stuff. And mm -hmm. he was seeing how much the ch density is changing when you put together these atoms and molecules image and saying, uh, and Bader said atoms are transferable and so, mm -hmm. and he looked at this transferability and he says everything that happens is at the interface. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the, so this is what's interesting. So it's, that is the first sum there that is the important thing. And I wonder if this is not the way when you start making the machine learning and all these things, if, there is not a weight to put on this part and to look at what happens in this region, in the region where atoms get together. And when you put this type of Gaussian, and so this is kind of smoothing out the effect. And maybe you, there's more need to put more emphasis on where things happen. Mm. And so you see this is, um, okay. So, so, yeah. Otherwise, I would have many more things to say, but this is yeah. just. So we, we should we should have that lunch at some point. I would be very yes. to do it. Yeah. Okay. But um, so um, I think you're, you're making a, an, an excellent point, and I. So I think what is important to to understand here is that 
in this case, we are not using this density representation. So, so you're saying, you know, the Gaussians, they are very simple. They don't, they don't um, have put any emphasis on, on the tails or on the interfaces between atoms. Um, and that's correct. But the good thing is that, that uh, the, let's say the machine learning model, what it does is it, it uh, makes this electronegativity depend on the environment. And the environment in this case is described really by um, the positions of neighboring atoms. So this is a structural thing. Um, and I, in, in, I think what, what, what happens here is that the, um, the machine learning model can infer what is happening and, and how the atom in a molecule is different from an, another atom in a molecule, right? So it's not doing this by, 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 by physically looking at, 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 the, at, the, at the interface, but it, it allows distinguishing different atoms in a molecule. Ah, and what happens even say much, but if you put them together, if you have you know, the different C60 and 6C, I don't know how many, and to start putting things together, the way they compress each other by this, yeah. their interaction is yeah. reflected in this kind of terms. And this is when you are looking at, you no, know, just uh, uh, interaction energies or different mm -hmm. properties that occur now. This is um, something, uh, I think this is, is there something important happens even for dipole moments, although dipole moments might not be the best measure for, uh, because they are relatively unsensitive, but. Um, that, that, yeah, that, that's true. Um, yeah, this is actually next, uh, also an excellent point. So we do see that, that um, th this is a little bit ill posed in the sense that we can get different models that predict quite different charge distributions, but all of the same dipole moments. And, and we are definitely working on extending this beyond dipole moments at, at, the, at the moment. Yeah. It's also very important for, for solid state applications, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I stop because I could continue with miss many points. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, I just want to briefly verify with Albert if his question was in the me and while answered because we discussed a little bit about um, uh, about the density and the sensitivity. Is it okay? Because I think it was more or less answered, but if, uh, if I'm mistaken, please Albert react. And uh, yeah, we have a question, questions here. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, question about, oh, first, thank you very much for the excellent talk. This was very interesting. Thank you. And a question about the iterative training. Um, in the end, I wasn't quite sure what um, exactly is in your loss function there. Because, I mean, the problem is probably that I'm just used to the gradient descent training, and there we'll probably have the density and the energy in the loss function somehow. So I was. Yeah. So in I, this case, only the energy is in the loss function. Okay. Yeah, um, and in fact, this is a this is a a, a limitation of, of this approach. Yes, yeah. we, we cannot easily put the density into the loss function, so we have to learn it indirectly in this case. Um, but and this is why this iterative training is so important. So what this does is it um, uh, you know it, the, the you you train the model on your reference densities, um, but essentially the information that is missing is whether that density is um, the a minimum or not. Yeah. So something that we could do, but it, it's also a little bit tricky, is to train on the on the um, exchange correlation potential. And this is this would be probably the the most rigorous way of doing this, because then you know what one, once we've described the energy density dependence correctly, we automatically get the right density out. We don't need to train on it. Yeah, exactly. That would have been my next question. Yeah. So, so kind of our, our goal here is to not train on the density because it has has some problems. And to be honest, it is it's it's not even clear what what when you say you want to train on the density, it's not even clear what you want to do, right? Do you want to do it, you know, like a root mean squared the deviation of the density? It's a very poor measure of, of the density because it's super dominated by large regions. So so this is this is tricky. I mean, there's a slew of papers about you know saying comparing the accuracy of DFT densities, and it's not not really clear they, they 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 tend to disagree with each other somewhat and um so it, it's not so easy to train on the density even conceptually yet, in my opinion. yeah but so training on the exchange collation potential would be an option for you as well yes 
So we have done that. I mean, but there the problem is usually getting the exchange collation potential because inverting, I'm not sure if we are still talking about inverting cone charm systems, that's what we did at some point, but it's usually quite difficult to arrive at a good exchange collation potential. Yeah, I mean, so it depends. I mean, if you do, you know, if, if you do for, for exchange, I think it, it, it's fairly straightforward. For correlation, it's very complicated, yeah. And so ultimately this iterative training, it's, it's like doing, it's like using a numerical exchange correlation potential. That's maybe one way to think about it because you, you simply look at other densities, you know, and, and you look at the energy they have and that allows you to kind of reconstruct the, the exchange, uh, the potential. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, we reached more or less uh, the 12.30, the predicted time, we are perfectly on time. Uh, and so if there are no other uh, questions at this moment, we can uh, close the session. Uh, thanks, uh, Hannes, again. Thank you. Thanks Thank for the invitation you. again. And, uh, and when will the, we'll resume at uh, 2 p.m.